Um, okay, so the topic at hand, um, and I've got a lot of feelings about anti-vaxxing, and, and as I was, I, I only really started preparing this topic um, in, in the last two months, um, and already by the weekend, I was worrying that this that in fact this topic's now redundant because Australia has achieved very high vaccination rates. It looks like we're gonna eventually peak into the mid nineties. It's gonna really be a global success story in terms of COVID-19 vaccination. Um, and so is the anti-vax movement really something worth freaking out about at this point? Um, and maybe it's not, but, but at the same time, uh, let me let me give the context of it. I, I started sort of put, putting this together. Um, I don't know if it was in the media for all of you. Um, in September, there were big anti-lockdown, anti-vax um, protests in Melbourne, and these extraordinary images of of the protesters uh, attacking the cops and and many cops ending up in hospital. Um, which is really quite unusual because Melbourne, I mean, what people do in the weekend in Melbourne, there's footy and there's protests. Melbourne is a protest city and the cops are generally actually fairly good at managing protests without escalating them. There's a real kind of buddy-buddy feeling between the kind of, you know, this running series of protests and the cops. It's quite unusual for them, for the violence to escalate in that way. And there's a double... Um, Kind of interest here is that generally there's a tacit understood um, convergence of 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 um, interests between um, the cops and the political right. Um, and what was interesting about these protests is that they were primarily alt right identified, and that um, and so suddenly there was this 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 polarization not between the 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 cops and the activists left but between the cops and the and the um alt-right um and 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 that was really interesting to me and it kind of culminated in an interesting sort of media moment where senior sergeant crystal mitchell resigned on social media like in this sort of um video cast um in uniform was like i can't do this anymore i can't be part of the uh, i don't want to put words in her mouth but it was an anti-vax anti-lockdown position of, of sort of oppressing the citizens of Australia in the name of this um, pandemic. So, and that feels already very far away, but just literally yesterday, a whole bunch of things made me think, maybe this is worth still talking about. Um, uh, firstly, Big Bird, do you know Big Bird from Sesame Street, Big Yellow Bird? <laughs> Big Bird announced that they had just had their, their, their vax. And lo and behold, uh, this became a political thing on Twitter um, with Biden saying, oh, great, you know, doing the right thing. And, and like sort of serial asshole um, Ted Cruz uh, launching into an attack supported by many other kind of alt-right slash Republicans about how this was sort of, um, you know, uh, communism and the end of democracy and human rights. It's a very interesting discourse and I'm going to revisit. At the same time, another new thing happened yesterday. The Steiner School in Byron Bay um, it hit a kind of a point of crisis because with the introduction of vaccine mandate for teachers, a third of their teachers were not vaccinated. Um, and so that became a, 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 a sort of educational issue. Um, at the same time, uh, interestingly enough, a, a nurse in Perth yesterday was criminally charged for faking giving someone a vaccine for pretending to injecting them but not actually injecting the the vaccination liquid into 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 a child um and throwing the hypodermic away um with the vaccine still in it um so all of this is so there, there's anti-vax stuff going on but what interests me even more than that as a kind of a bit of a as a third world subject is 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 what's going on in in png at the moment where the vaccine rate is actually lower than 2%. Um, 
And it's not just because of lack of availability of vaccines, although that's a, a significant factor. It's also because of a kind of massive um, power of evangelical Christian anti-vaxxing. And so there's a hugely um, popular um, anti-vax movement linked to, fundam to evangelical fundamentalist Christianity. Um, so it seems like it is worth in some ways talking about anti-vax. Uh, now, uh, despite this apparent success, uh, the, the the thing that needs to be explaining is why I'm talking about it from a perspective of violence, because that's all I really go on about. I'm this one trick pony who talks about violence. So, 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 so why anti-vax and violence? Well, firstly, these links between acts of physical violence um, and and anti-vax. Um, and so we saw those in the Melbourne protests. We saw the physical assaults of police. We saw the police also assaulting protesters. Another thing that's been documented in the last few weeks is, an, is a sustained pattern of death threats to Australian medical experts. And um, these are primarily the people who've been in the media giving the, the sort of state updates. Um, uh, but also individual doctors in private practice have been given death threats because of their participation in the vaccine rollout. So those are, are very standard physical and, 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 and obviously criminalized um, acts. Um, but what interests me is I, is, is I want to use this as a kind of a transition um, example to talk about the indirect forms of violence and the forms of violence that that sort of are outside thresholds of, 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 of criminality and the law and, and, and even our sort of conceptualization of social ethics. Um, and so what's really fundamental in this work as within a lot of my previous work is the notion of structural violence and to look at anti-vax as, as a form of structural violence that places vulnerable people at risk that it leads, the, the, the anti-vax sort of so, social apparatus leads to suffering, disability, and death. And, and, and it's unevenly distributed um, against people who are already socially vulnerable for a whole lot of reasons. That, those may be phys physical reasons to do with health, it may be socioeconomic reasons, it may be geopolitical reasons. Um, on the other hand, the anti-vax movement itself uh, makes claims of violence. Uh, and one of the claims is that th that vaccination is an act of physical assault, that, it, that it's an act of harming in like a non-consensual harm to the human body. Um, and in fact, one of, and one of the ways they narrated is also as the, the, the vaccine rollout as, as a kind of attempt at genocide. And here they invoke a kind of Geneva Convention history of um, of of not of of of, of, no, of not allowing uh, medical experimentation uh, on on non consenting subjects, and of course, I mean this is a big part of why we even have research ethics committees in universities is because we worry about so much. So so the anti vax is not honorating the vaccine rollout as an act of violence, and not only as an act of physical violence, but as an act of kind of social structural violence in that the vaccine rollout is seen as a gateway to political uh, totalitarianism. By getting people to acquiesce control of their bodies, this will somehow lead to the collapse of democracy and a, and a specter of some kind of Stalinist communism uh, slash new world order taking over the world. Um, so, so from the anti-vax side, there's also kind of a, a, accounts of, um, um, of, of, of vaccination as violence. Um, so what I really want to do is, is, is to, to, to try and shift the framing of anti-vax. And I'm using the word anti-vax to describe a kind of a social phenomenon, which to me is more interesting than anti-vaxxers, which tends to identify a kind of like aberrant individuals. Um, and, 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 and theoretically, I suppose I'm a, 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 a pretty stand up for Coldian um, and that I'm interested in uh, anti-vax as a kind of a discourse that produces social positions, that produces identities and that, that, that creates a, a, a social structure. Um, and, and, and in looking at that discourse, there's a number of questions that I want to ask. Like firstly, 
um, where does it come from? Um, how, how, how does this discourse come into being or these discourses? Um, secondly, how do they achieve plausibility effects and social traction? And this is a non-obvious um, kind of issue because to most outsiders, anti-vaxxing, the anti-vax ideology seems crazy. Uh, it's, it, it, it externally seems preposterous. So, so how does it come to be passionately believed? And thirdly, what are the social consequences of that? What are the, what are the effects of this social, this, this, the social apparatus of, of, of anti-vax and its, and its current rise? Um, what I'm not interested in spending any time doing, uh, including in the question and answers, is uh, either refuting uh, individual anti-vax claims or cosmologies or of defending the scientific consensus. I'm just assuming the scientific consensus is right, and that's a conversation for other people to have on another day. Um, the other thing is, is, is that anti-vax is, is, is not one thing. It's a very, it's not even a spectrum really. It's a, it's, it's a real intersecting flow of multiple beliefs and ideas and positions. Um, but we, there are a couple of things we can clarify. First is the difference between general anti-vax and specific COVID-19 anti-vax. That anti-vax ideology has a, has a fairly long history. Um, and COVID-19 anti-vaxxing is obviously very recent. It only really comes into being last year. Um, and many COVID-19 anti-vaxxers are not general anti-vaxxers. Many of them you know, will still want their children to get measles vaccinations and things, or will go for a tetanus shot if they get an injury. Um, but they, 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 they have quite a specific objection to the COVID-19 well, and this is an interesting word, is the COVID-19 vaccine. And that, that really interests me, the, the vaccine, because there is no the vaccine. That, that the COVID-19 vaccination technologies are themselves highly differentiated. There's at least four major classes, um, the nucleic mRNA um, type, the viral vector adenovirus type, the protein subunit type uh, and the whole attenuated or inactivated virus type. These are completely different types of vaccines. Their technologies have completely different histories. Some are fairly new, some are very old, but you, you, I've never seen within anti-vax discourse uh, a, a, a differentiation between them. And often the anti-vax discourse is directed at claims about specifically about mRNA, um, COVID-19 vaccines, as if these represent the field um, of, of um, um, COVID-19 vaccination. Um, I also want to differentiate that there's a kind of a, a spectrum of intensity, which is really important to separate out. The one, the one is the, what, you know, you know the, the medical folks on TV like to call vaccine hesitancy, which is typically describing people who are a bit unsure. They've heard, ooh, they've heard about side effects. They're not sure about should I do this, shouldn't I do it, and 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 and, and that really is what is one range of social positions which I want to differentiate from um, that from hardcore anti-vax. And the hardcore anti-vax is a is firstly a, tends to be a very very passionately held position. Um, it, it's not an inquiring position. It's a committed position to the idea that vaccines are definitely harmful, but it's also not just committed to that. And what this is what gives it both its kind of affect um, and its politics is that is, it's not just that vaccines are harmful, they're part of a malign social project, that there's something bad going on in the world behind the vaccine rollout. And that's the position that seems to make people violent. That's the position that makes them want to kill doctors or public health officials who are talking on TV or to attack the cops in, in Melbourne CBD. Um, and the, the critical difference there is that the vaccine hesitant tend to have fragments of misinformation in a sort of field of, 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 of discourse, whereas the hardcore anti-vaxxers are fully inducted into a kind of enclosed anti-vax cosmology. And so their, their worldview is essentially anti-vax and their explanation of society and politics and, and other notions such as, such as freedom 
uh, are, are defined within that anti-vax cosmology. Um, and the direct violence is, is certainly associated primarily with um, hardcore anti-vaxxers. But what's important to note then is within the hardcore anti-vax uh, system, it's, the issue is not the claims themselves. The issue is not specific quasi-medical or quasi-scientific claims. The issue is within the, the framing of the, the meaning of the claims. The issue is within framing uh, an understanding of society. Um, and, and that's what I want to draw attention to and, and, get, and get us to think about is, 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 is the, the, the framing and the meaningfulness of, of anti-vax claims. Um, and as soon as we look at that, there's a couple of things we have to put to bed. Um, and the first is that the anti-vax movement is anti-science. It's absolutely not. It is, it is the anti-vax movement is kind of obsessed with science. And one of the most highly valued things within the anti-vax movement are dissident medical experts. Um, and the misuse of medical terms is fundamental to anti-vax vax discourse and citing research studies is a very very highly discussed valued discursive practice um, and some of the big favorites of anti-vaxxers are nobel prize winner carrie mullis who actually won the nobel prize for inventing pcr the way of uh, testing for viruses which is the basis for our COVID 19 tests um, so the, 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 this up till now, the standard COVID-19 test has been based on an idea that Kerry Mullis um, got the Nobel Prize for, um, but not many years ago before COVID existed. Um, and, um, and, and he interestingly became a, a, a viral denialist, and he was one of the people that led the AIDS denialist movement. Um, uh, the other sort of big favorite of anti-vaxxers is the Great Barrington De Declaration, which is this kind of uh, cluster of purportedly medical experts who signed a kind of a big anti-lockdown, uh, uh, anti-COVID denialist document last year, fairly early in the in the sort of Trump years of the pandemic. Um, so anti-vaxxers are not anti-science. They are also not anti-rational. In fact, they are hyper-rational. In fact, they are exactly paranoid um, that, they are, that they really reach into explanation. They try and find ways of accounting for multiple fragments of information. And, and the essential of the parano paranoia, they're going beyond the normal connecting of the dots. Um, is, 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 is an interest in a kind of a hyper-rationality, but it's a persecutory hyper-rationality. Um, but it is, it's very interested in uh, asserting relationships between uh, fragments of evidence. Um, and the, the, the reason I want to emphasize that is because I want to get away from a, an, another kind of knee-jerk reaction, which I find even in myself, um, which is to dismiss anti-vax as ignorant and stupid. And to just be like, uh, that's that's just crazy bullshit. Um, um, and to try and 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 grant that there's something more complex than that going on with anti-vax. And and one of the reasons this is important, because a lot of public health practice is actually built on this kind of uh, uh, public health rationality that 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 assumes that what's wrong with anti-vaxxers is that they, 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 they have incorrect factual information, and this can be helpfully corrected by simply giving them correct factual information. But so saying like, oh, the, these are mistaken beliefs. Um, we don't believe them as scientists. Here are the correct beliefs. And, and making available correct scientific statements uh, uh, and um, and, and cataloging incorrect scientific statements is incorrect. And a lot of public health education proceeds like that, and, and it's uh, not really a, very effective. And, and in previous historical pandemics, it's shown to, to have been catastrophic to operate with that kind of rationality. Um, so if anti-vax is a kind of discursive formation, 
it also doesn't just fall out of the sky. It comes from somewhere. And there's a there's the kind of long histories of anti-vax, but the, the current ones, the, the, the relatively recent ones that are varying, I, I divide into two groups. The first is the kind of Californian anti-vax thing, which is a movement that starts in the 1990s as part of the sort of middle class, new age, natural health movement. And it's all about um, healthy eating, removal of toxins, electromagnetic fields, alternative health practices, Eastern religion, all of that kind of tumbles together, yogurt, I mean, yoga, um, organic food, all, all bundles together in this ideological formation that at its kind of discursive core has a differentiation between the natural and the chemical. And so natural things are good, um, and chemical things are bad. So, and of course, any kind of medical technology is then rapidly on the side of the unnatural and the bad. And anything that doesn't have organophosphates or isn't genetically modified is on the side of the good. So, um, obviously, this is a kind of, well, I don't want to go into that preposterous dichotomy that falls down immediately, as do all of these. Um, the effects of that were to popularize as part of, uh, of kind of US media um, colonialism, a, 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 a kind of soccer mom anti-vax movement of the last 30 years. Um, and, to, and it led directly to the reemergence of infectious diseases in Californian schools, like outbreaks of measles and things like that, that had previously been almost completely eliminated. Okay. Then there's a newer movement, which is the, 1920, uh, the 2020s sort of US alt-right Trumpist neoliberal cluster, which is a, 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 a rapidly emerging um, movement and there the link is it, it it doesn't start being anti-vax it starts being anti it starts being covered denialist so in its formative moments from february of last year it's about it's just the flu this kind of trumpist slogan it's just the flu um because it's just the flu it's anti-masking and it's anti-lockdown um and um, and 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 what's interesting about it is it's it's related to two obvious political projects. Firstly, the political project of the Trump presidency, which is in itself a sub project of the of of, of kind of um, corporate uh, interests in in the United States and less globally, that it becomes about um, business. It becomes about stopping lockdown, stopping restrictions in order that commerce can thrive. Um, and it, it's a really interesting uh, kind of ideological aggregation. Um, and, and it manifests in this example of Ted Cruz freaking out about Big Bird getting vaccinated. Um, is, it, is it links to essentially the, the, the ideology of neoliberalism? It, 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 it's this sort of like Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, but above all Ayn Rand um, ideology of um, sort of capitalism and freedom. Um, and the idea that uh, society does not exist, that Thatcherite slogan, there's no such thing as society, and that selfishness is a good, which is the essential kind of core Randian psychopathic assertion, is that um, selfishness is good and it creates good for everyone. And that's why capitalism is the best thing that's ever happened to the human race. Um, so it's deeply embedded in that ideological history. Um, what's interesting uh, in, is in recent research, what's been shown is that most of the online anti-vax content, when, and that's where anti-vax lives. It lives in the online social media space before it becomes a kind of social movement and a, and a cluster of identities. Is it, it, it's highly centralized, that it originates in, uh, most of it originates in actually 12 different sources. Um, so it's, it's, it's highly se centralized and, it, and it's centralized in different kinds of ways. And when we look at who's generating anti-vax content, it becomes clearer what the kind of, the interests behind it are. Um, and there are a number of things that we want, need to identify in those interests. Firstly, there's a kind of direct commercial benefit to circulating fake news, like just the money you get every time someone clicks a link. 
doesn't matter what the content of the link is. The function of the link is to be clickbait, is to incite the click. What happens after that is of no interest to the people who are making money from that link. It's simply incite the clicking. Um, and so, and, and there's a good fit between scaremongering material such as anti-vax material and, and, and the monetization of clicks. Um, there's also another kind of commercial interest in the dissemination uh, that is also agnostic with respect to the content, which is, is the social media by algorithm. And the fact that social media, and we, you saw the, the big sort of uh, Facebook whistleblower come out last month, is that Facebook works, as do Twitter and everything else, works by, re by retaining attention. And it retains attention by, 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 um, by essentially by, by scaremongering, both by giving people media that they have kind of positive responses to, but also me media that fills them with alarm in a, in a very, very classic kind of media theory um, uh, way that we've, we've sort of that, that the media theorists have theorized for about you know at least the last five decades but now social media does it by algorithm which is an entirely different way of doing it um, and so that the reason Facebook is one of the most prof the, uh, profitable companies in the world at the moment is because of the way in which it um, attracts attention by algorithm um, but that means that it it agnostically promotes by accident certain kind of content and the kind of content it promotes is inflammatory and polarizing content. Um, then there's the people who have direct commercial benefits. So Mac the McCola industry, um, Joe McCola, um, big health food company, they, they're a major source of anti-vax content because then they sell people alternative um, ways of keeping healthy. They, se they sell them all the the, the, the kind of naturopathic alternatives to vaccination. Um, and within that also, there's a kind of an anachronistic benefit. Um, is, and, and this is the trouble with discursive formations is you, is you never know where they're going to end up. So a lot of the political interest that generated COVID denialism as a way of keeping business open for profit, um, they, that, that they generated media and discourses and cosmologies um, that then became the, the foundation of anti-vaxxing. But the trouble is they no longer have an interest in anti-vaxxing. In fact, the more people get vaxxed, the, the better it will be for, for, for business and profit. But, but the, the horses bolted. Um, so they've constructed a, 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 the, 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 the um, interpretative preconditions for, for um, anti-vax extremism. And, and, and now they can't kind of dial it back. Um, and Trump tried to in this critical moment where he, he, he went from being a COVID denialist, anti-masker to being like, yeah, I brought you, it's my vaccine, I brought it to you. So he tried to flip the, the, the discourse around, but it, it, it has fundamentally not worked. Then there's another kind of political gain. And this is, um, once again, it, it, it epitomized in the Repu US Republicans, um, but in fact, it's much more toxic in other countries like Brazil, um, where the, the emergence of these new right um, um, political people who, 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 whose whole politics is a politics of polarization and outrage, is constructing outrage at someone or something. They have no positive policies. They just are, they just are angry about something else. Um, and that's the, I mean, Trump obviously is the metaphor for that, but, but in developing countries, the leaders who've, who've followed that model have actually had much more toxic effects in terms of the amount of suffering and death that they've caused. Um, the problem is we can identify all of these origin interests, um, but also we need to acknowledge that anti-vax becomes this autonomous discursive machine that, that then produce, that runs itself. And then it ends up with some, you know, someone's uh, grandpa and someone's auntie circulating stuff on, on, on Twitter or WhatsApp. Um, and so the interests don't need to keep their hands in the fire. They can, it, it, it then becomes this autonomous 
self-generating thing that relies precisely on the the algorithmic distribution of information that I talked about earlier. So there's a lot there's a lot going on politically, economically, um, uh, within anti-vax that isn't about the claims. It isn't about the specific anti-vax claims. But what this leads me to then, um, in terms of trying to say, well, well, where are you going with this analysis, uh, is, is to, to a number of, of kind of conclusions and highlights. The first is, we need to stop thinking about anti-vax um, as, a, as a single coherent position, because it's not. It's a highly mobile, uh, it, it is, it, paradoxically, it is highly viral. It mutates, it infects, it transforms itself, becomes multiple things as it spreads. Um, also, that anti-vax is not anti-rational and it's not anti-scientific. It precisely, it precisely reinscribes uh, rationality and science in particular ways. Uh, and best understood in this, I think the slogan that should really strike fear into the hearts of every social science academic in the world is the phrase, I've done my own research. I don't think we, I don't think we are scared enough of what the appropriation of kind of uh, the new alt-right slash COVID denialist slash anti-vax um, social movements, that how, how, how serious the appropriation of the, I've done my own uh, re research and the, the idea of, 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 firstly of research, but secondly of academic freedom, that the people have done, they've done their own research as against the totalitarian systems of the nanny state that are trying to silence people who have um, been conscripted into YouTube algorithms uh, and 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 we're not taking that seriously enough um as i mentioned before the other thing that 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 that, that i'm trying to draw attention to is is the 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 problems of of identifying anti-vax as ignorance and saying well what we need to do is correct the ignorance with correct scientific information uh, and what that misunderstands is that, that, is that the anti-vax claims are claims within a meaning system. And when, when you know, the chief health officer tries to give a scientific claim, counterclaim, it's already explained in advance. And this, and this is the, the paranoid genius of conspiracy theories. It explains everything outside itself in advance. So it's simply, well, the, the claims by the... Um, uh, the, the medical authorities, the claims by the CDC, the claims by the chief health, health officers, they're, they're already in advance known to be malign expressions of covert totalitarian interests and a whole lot of other kind of paranoid machinations. Um, and, and the objection to them is not the objection to the science. It's, it, it's, a, it's actually a reading of, of social power um, and, and the way in which the claims and counter claims are being plugged into um, ideas of independent thought versus uh, kind of totalitarianism. And this, this once again plugs back into the neoliberal libertarian kind of history of anti-vax is that, that at its core, it's libertarian because it's linked to a particular libertarian version of capitalism. And that's where the Rand, the Ayn Rand neoliberal history kind of fits in. Um, instead, what we need to take seriously is that anti-vaxism is meaningful. We need to really, we need to stop and say, well, anti-vax is meaningful for its subjects. Um, it explains networks of experience and information. It explains a kind of general feeling of powerlessness, which other critical social scientists, scientists may explain in other ways. But it, it explains, as Trump did, that subjective feeling of, of powerlessness. And, and more than that, explains a feeling of anxiety that the pandemic brings, the anxiety of vulnerability. And, and one of the sort of core features of all alt-right thinking is that it's a way of disavowing vulnerability. So the way of disavowing the vulnerability of the pandemic is to become a COVID denialist, which then sets you down this kind of railway line where you end up than being an anti-vaxxer. And it's experienced as empowering. It, it transforms these, these feelings of social powerlessness and anxiety into anger, which is a much more empowering emotion. Um, so so anti-vax 
um, discourse is actually doing a lot of identity work and a lot of social co cohesion work in a certain kind of way within those within those enclosed communities. Okay, um, so let me sort of wrap up there with leaving those key points for thinking, but also to link back to the question of violence. Okay. Um, why am I, as a, as, a, as a student of violence, trying to talk about anti-vaxxing? Uh, as I mentioned before, because anti-vax ideology leads to acts of direct violence, to the death threats and assault we mentioned, in the US, we haven't seen it yet in Australia, in the US, for instance, with the, the, the precursor, which was the anti-masking movement, we saw a number of murders, like of, of people shooting shop security because they were asked to wear a mask. And the threats of those violence are, are still current, but they're not, but they haven't been enacted as much. Um, but that's not the point. The point is the structural violence. The point is that the anti-vax as a system places vulnerable people at risk of harm. It places people who are vulnerable because of their health, because of their immune systems, because of their age, because of their socioeconomic situation, because of the, which may lead them to have or not have access to medical resources. They may be living in situations of urban overcrowding with, 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 with weak public health infrastructure. And globally, this plays out in a really devastating way. Um, and so the 5 million people who've already died of COVID are kind of testament to the fact that that structural violence really impacts in the most brutal possible way um, on people. The problem is that we don't know how to think about structural violence in a kind of criminal justice way. We know how to think about direct violence and assaults and death threats and murders, um, but we don't know how to think about the fact that that telling someone they shouldn't get vaccinated for this particular reason um, ends up leading other vulnerable people to becoming cr uh, chronically ill, disabled, or to their premature death. Um, and, and the key kind of conundrum in, in this is, is, is the whole way in which we envisage responsibility. Um, and that structural violence doesn't have malicious agents. It doesn't have bad criminals trying to do something bad. Sometimes it does. Sometimes there's the Trumps and the Ted Cruz who, who really have criminal projects and the Bolsonaros. Um, but mostly it's not, there's not that explicit intention that is um, uh, to commit harm. And, and so it becomes unintelligible from, from a standard criminal justice standpoint. Um, and what it points to is this fundamental need to, 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 to have ways of talking about responsibility for structural violence and mechanisms of accountability for structural violence. And that's really where I want, uh, uh, that's the terrain I want to open up for people to start thinking about. Um, okay, so in conclusion, we've got this, the, the anti-vaxxing existing in a social system of, of inequality. You've got, you know, Privileged Californian soccer moms versus poor migrant families, overcrowded communities, limited health service. The soccer moms can afford to be anti-vaxxers because they will get that the, 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 the things will work out okay for them. Other vulnerable people, the elderly, the immune compromised won't. Um, that this all can't be understood without understanding the system of deregulated capitalism, the, the kind of neoliberal project of the last. Uh, 40 years, um, and, and the sort of enmeshed unintended consequences of COVID denialism. That's linked very deeply to kind of the, the ideology that was developed specifically to rationalize that neoliberalism, the, the kind of Ayn Rand, Margaret Thatcher, there's no such thing as society, and the idea um, that, that acting in the public interest, acting in collective interest, making minor sacrifices for the social good. Um, that just got erased as a kind of a, as a, as a, as the dominant ethical position um, and as a definition of kind of decency um, and replaced by this um, uh, untrammeled pursuit of, of, of self-interest at all costs. That linked to the the, 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 the forms of profiting, um, the, the profit by scaremongering, the clickbait economy, the fact that uh, 
information independent circulation of, 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 of things that simply attract clicks um, generates profit. The fact that um, algorithms which serve to polarize people on social media and um, create massive profits for social media companies. The, the, and another thing that a whole nother talk needs to be on, which is the, the role of psychographic targeting, that there's now this massive information, 5 billion people with, with, with a thousand uh, points of, of information on them on Facebook alone. So 5 trillion information points being kind of um, subject to analysis to psychographically target exactly what information would can be individualized to produce change in particular individuals and that then being exploited by specific interests. Um, and the cynical politics of constructing paranoid enemies and the way in which some pol pol political um, movements, especially kind of uh, sort of new right movements, um, um, rely on that as, as their political project. So essentially what I'm drawing to attention to is away from the idea of anti-vax as, as ignorance, uh, anti-vax as a kind of personal ethical failing, like not caring enough, and towards a kind of structural analysis of anti-vax as a convergence of kind of corporate and political interests, as well as an emergent set of communicative technologies, specifically the algorithm-driven social media technologies. Um, and that in the light of our failure to, to even have a way of starting to conceptualize what a social justice, let alone criminal justice response to that would look like. And that's it. Thank you, Anthony. That was um, amazing, really interesting. Uh, I, I so enjoyed it um, because I think perhaps like you and I'm guessing like many people who are here, you know, listening, um, it's been a quandary, you know, people that you thought you knew or, you know, so thinking about it through this lens actually sheds, gives us a different way of thinking and talking about this. And given that, I, I mean, I've got some things that I found really interesting and that I'd like to ask about, but I'm sure others so have questions too. So I'd like to open it up for questions. And given that my talk is a bit wacky and all over the place, you can ask <laughs> questions that are wacky and all over the place. You just can't ask bullshit anti-vax questions because I just won't answer them. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. This is Gina. I'm sorry, I can't get my video working, so I can't even put a picture on there. Still trying to work this out. But I very much enjoyed that. And it's a topic very close to, to me. Um, as I've just said, I've lost some, some good friends just over the fact that um, they are, as you described, um, people that are happy to smoke or drink or, you know, take recreational drugs, but they don't want a vaccine. Um, so I have to, I, I have had it. I've had to have it because of my own health issues. But how, my question is, sorry, how can you relay or have a rational, logical kind of conversation with people who are so steadfast in their attitude against the COVID vaccination? I think this is a really important question and here's my really important answer. You can't. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I thought it was me. No, no, and this is very serious because, and because this is what's freaking out mainstream public health. And I have a bit of a background in public health amongst almost every other social science. Um, that 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 the idea that you can you can provide them with correct information and provide them with a a careful explanation of what is incorrect about their current beliefs and 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 the and the basis for the authority of a set of counter beliefs that project in the case of of the mild vaccine hesitant that that can work but in the case of the hardcore anti vaxxers it cannot work because it's already inoculated against your position. It's already has built into its cosmology why your position is suspect and its position is the truth. 
Um, so, so and 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 so this is why I want I want to challenge kind of you know the public health people to 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 take to take that realization seriously. There are some people who are who are lost to that kind of rationality already. Um, but they're not lost to everything. Okay, so and and that's why I think one of the things we can do is to say, well, if we analyze the system that constructed their subject positions. We can try to dismantle that system or construct or create a, a system that produces different subject positions. I will and just so add that these people that I'm talking about have uh, using their Christianity beliefs to support their attitudes about the about not taking taking the vaccine. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean that's what anti-vax does. It plugs into pre-existing systems, so it plugs into pre-existing religious systems or New Age philosophies or or, or 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 right wing libertarian philosophies, it 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 it, it it's precisely like a virus. It it kind of goes into that system and mutates and modifies that system to make it a new functioning thing. Um, and 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 so that's why religious evangelicals, neoliberals, they the ones whom the anti vax system it really locks and glues. And becomes a, a an an an, an unshakable um, position, and 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 it's got a whole lot of other stuff built into it. For instance, like if you ever wondered why, like people who are part of that kind of bullshit, one of the big things they talk about is is um, ivermectin. Like, why do anti-vaxxers love ivermectin? Well, it, it it's part of the cosmology, um, because what I the, the claim that ivermectin, ivermectin cures COVID-19 shows you why you don't need a vaccine in the first place and why the vaccine rollout is a hoax. And it, because, because the, the, the conspiring powers are suppressing the fact that it is, a, it is a known curable disease. It isn't a dread fatal disease at all. And so they're quashing this scientific findings of cover making to try and trick you into getting a vaccine and so and but at every point when you try and engage an anti-vaxxer it's a sort of infinite regress where they come up with another quasi-scientific claim so then it's then it's you know ivermectin then it's the Balfour declaration then it's Carrie Mullis denouncing his own Nobel Prize winning discovery um and 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 I forget what the name of the, this this claim has a name now because it's so well recognized. It it, it takes an order of magnitude more work to re, refute bullshit than to generate it, and that's where we trap. That it's it's much more work, and part of me is like, well, really, if you want to undo anti-vaxxing, you need to go back to the origins of deregulated capitalism. You need to go to those the ideologues like you know. Everyone who read Ayn Rand as a teenager and actually believed it, you know, the whole um, the, the whole shift of the of, of 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 the political right in the West to become a kind of a, a neoliberal far right, all of all of that. Um, which of course, if 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 people are going to be dying in the next few months, you don't have time for that. And that's I, I guess what I find so upsetting. Thank you. Jody um, has asked a question in chat, and I think you've been speaking to it a bit. It's about um, how do we respond to the I've done my own research quandary, but then she's added on to that, and I think this is interesting too, um, mentioning soccer mum, um, does that mean gender is part of the analysis? So there's two bits to that question mm -hmm. there. The second one first, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm always really interested in how gender plays out. And the interesting thing is that the two, the two anti-vax clusters that are that identified are, are gendered. That the Californian New Age one tends to be feminine and the and the Trumpist alt-right one tends to be masculine. So the, the so so what we saw on the streets of Melbourne was was young men in their 20s and 30s. Uh, um, and being being very masculine, being very aggressive, being very like you want to fucking fight, 
Um, so, so there's a real gendering of, 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 of that um, assemblage versus the new age assemblage tends to be feminized. It tends to be, um, it, it, it tends to be the domain of, 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 of family carers, people who have responsibility for children, people who have leisure time to engage in uh, a sort of alternative, alternate health practice. But within that, there's also a class dimension because the Trumpist one is a, is a working class masculinist movement, whereas the new age one is a, is a middle class, upper middle class sort of feminized movement. So I think class and gender um, play really important roles there. Um, I'm mindful of time, but I can see Justine has asked a, an interesting question, and this might be our last one. Um, so she uh, says that, that she's interested in your thoughts about how this plays out in the future as we hit vaccine milestones. Do you suspect these hardcore positions will die out or just morph into some other conspiracy theory? Um, that th they'll, they'll morph into some other conspiracy theory. I think that that's what they do. They, the nature of conspiracy theory, they're highly mobile and they just adapt themselves to, to, to new situations. Um, like a lot of people who were anti-vaxxers six, eight months ago are no longer simply because I've seen people not get like alien antenna growing out of their heads when they got vaccinated or whatever. Um, but but I want to sort of reframe it from a Southern perspective, because what's going to happen is that the violence of anti-vax is going to be happening overseas. It's not primarily going to be happening in Australia. It's firstly in Australia going to happen in marginalized communities and migrant and indigenous communities where it's already happening. And um, that that's where it's going to be felt. Um, but it's but the some of the terrible work of 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 the of the U.S. anti-vax movement is in developing countries, and because those ideas sort of tumble through the global media system, they end up kind of hybridizing with local um, cosmologies, like the like the uh, Papua New Guinea evangelical Christian movement, and they take on a a life there which is much more devastating because the social infrastructure is much less protective. And so, so, so anti-vax in the developing world um, is, is much, much, much more toxic and causes much more, more, more medical harm and death than it does in the developed world. Because even if, even if you do get infected because of some ludicrous anti-vax or you, because you become an anti-vaxxer yourself, you'll still get world-class healthcare and the latest covered drugs, which people you know, across Africa won't get. They will just die. Um, so, so in a sense, there's a real, the real toxicity of, of anti-vax as a, 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 as a discursive system that was generated out, out of political and economic interests in the West. It will, as it always does, it will, the pain of it will be in, 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 on bodies in the global south. Thanks, Anthony. Um, uh, so we're, we're really out of time, but I really want to thank Anthony for such an interesting and thought provoking presentation. You know, for me, the insight into the relationship between the human and non-human actors in this space and the discursive and non-discursive practices are really important in getting us to understand the challenges and complexity in relation to this. So I'd like everyone to join with me in thanking Anthony. And um, I look for, forward to the next time um, they uh, uh, offer uh, and contact us to present a seminar. You're always welcome. Um, and hopefully we can have you come and do it in person soon. Yeah, I think 